Hello, I'm Michael Redman, professional Go player. In this video, I'm going to show you a game I played against Soto Yanagi 7, and he's a 3 dawn professional Go player. A relatively young player, I think he's in his mid-20s. This was in the Kiriyama Cup, and it was the final of the B section. In this game, I have the black stones, and I played a 3-4 point. And the big Shimari. So here black has the big corner enclosure and white played a low kakari. As in the last few games that I've been showing you in these videos, I tried the kick here. So this is a position where black, of course, could have played any kind of a pincer. And recently people play this pressing move and it does become very sharp. Although I have researched this, I felt I should probably avoid this. And I played this move, which is a, a calmer move. It has a more settled board position. And I was sort of trying out this kind of game in the last few games I've been playing. So white plays a high extension. This is the way the computers like to play it. The computer programs like to play this high extension, where before we had neural networks, people were generally playing this extension on the third line. So that's a way that Go has changed here, and it's a sign that he does study with computer programs, I think. And I get to play this approach move in the lower left. So that's what I'm doing with this Joseki I chose in the lower right corner, where it's a forced sequence that gives Black the tempo, it gives Black sente. Because if White does not answer that, if White plays, for instance, in this corner, the, the pincer here is very effective. To a certain degree, I'm taking control of the opening. So this is a position where white's normal move would be something in the lower left corner. So for instance, white could play something like this. And I'll probably play an approach move towards the upper left corner. There's three areas in this in this opening that are all very big. There's the upper side, and the right side, and the left side. And the lower side is relatively small. So one thing that I'm thinking of doing, for instance, for instance, if we get into something like this, then this also is a very big point, which will put some pressure on white in the lower right area also. But in this case, white played here. So white played here, allowing me to press in the lower left. And I played the extension here. In this case, the upper side and the right side seem to be Mi. And white played here. My instinct was that this was an overextension. So in this kind of board position, I'm always checking the ladders. So to start with, I'm going to show you what ladders I'm talking about. So black plays the attachment here. If white plays a honey underneath, which is the game move, black plays the double honey. And when white cuts here, there are two ladders that you have to know or check before you play, hopefully. And one is if white plays here, black can capture this stone on the ladder. So it might look like it's about to hit that white stone, but it's not going to hit it. It's it's going to hit the edge of the board before it hits that white stone. So it's going to go right next to the white stone, but black's going to capture. So that ladder works for black. Also, if white connects her, there's this ladder. And this also looks like it might be going towards the general area of that white stone there, but it's a valid ladder. It's going to work for black. Also, if black can capture in both of these ladders, both of these diagrams are good for black. So maybe white's going to push here in this case. Black can cut and play here. And this is going to be good for black also. If white jumps here, then black can play here. And this is threatening to capture white by covering it uh, S11. So white has to play here. And this is another ladder. This is a ladder too. So this is good for black. So white's probably going to answer here. And black can follow up with something like this. This is just looking good for black, with black starting to build some influence in the center of the board, which is going to work well with black's position on the left side. So black has a lot of potential in this general area. So in the game, white played this double honey. And this is something that's worth remembering. It's one of the Tesuji moves that white can play. In the past, what black usually does now is either to connect or extend to the fifth line. So let's do those two variations. If black connects here, white's going to play a hanging connection, and everything is connected. Black did get to play some forcing moves from above. 
So is black going to be satisfied with that? Probably not, but it's one variation that can happen. Or black can play here, and again white will need to protect something like this. And again black has played a forcing move from above. I, do, I did remember as I was playing that at some point I researched a similar position and was surprised to see Katago playing this move, allowing white a ponnuki towards the center of the board but taking some territory. So I figured that this might work, and black is threatening to extend here. So that's going to be bad for white. White has to capture the one stone. So this, is, was, this was forced, and black extends. And if the whole upper right corner becomes black's territory, this is just going to be good for black. And I think my opponent must have researched a similar position also, because according to Katawo, this was the correct move. Here, I played this move, which was not optimal. And I was very interested to see this diagram come up, where white is going to cut here and get some forcing moves, but white cannot capture that black stone in a ladder. White chases in a ladder anyway. And at this point, if white played here, this would not be so satisfying, because black would be able to cut here and capture, and would still have potential to attack the whole white group. So this would not be very good for white. Black has just a very strong position in the corner, and a big territory. It's a big territory, actually. So what white does is, instead of chasing the ladder, white plays here. This is the local move. It's a good shape move. It's very good. Because if black plays on this side, white can squeeze from this side and get a satisfactory shape. So black's going to play the bamboo joint here. And white can scoop out the corner. Actually, this whole variation, it's still good for black with a big curling move here, which is going to put pressure on the white stones on the outside. And that uh, so-called thick shape white got by capturing this stone, it's not actually all that thick. So uh, black can be satisfied with this result. With uh, reasonable territory in the upper right corner, black's territory is, is big enough, and black has a very thick, strong position there. So this would have been okay. Uh, but I didn't know that variation. And in the game I played here. This is a stronger response to white's probe, but white gets to play here. And this involves a race to capture, or maybe both sides living. So I crawled once, this was forcing. And then, actually, I sacrificed this group that I've just made, which was correct. So let's take a look at black making a living shape. So black can live with this. And uh, it's a living shape. White also has a living shape. But first, white's going to push through here and cut here. It's very important that white cuts here on the fifth line instead of cutting on the fourth line would be less effective. White would capture once, but at this point, white would have to go back to the corner to live. And after this, in some cases, black would be able to sacrifice the three stones. So white didn't have time to play that cut. For instance, if white had played it earlier, in this case, that exchange was pretty bad for white. So if white plays it first, white, black's going to add a stone there. But if white plays it later, it ceases to be important. So this would be about even. This would be about even. But actually, white's going to cut on the other side. And this is going to be a huge headache for black. So if black tries to make the same shape, white's not going to take the one stone this time. White's going to cut here. And this is, this is turning into a disaster for black. This is already very bad. Maybe black's going to connect. But this is going to be painful too. Um, because white pushes through here. You can see black's situation is not so good. And white can live. So this is going to be a bit painful for black. In the game, I did not allow white to crawl at two. Crawling at two was the key point that made all this trouble for black. So I uh, covered here. White captures the black group. But actually, this was okay for black. Black's large corner enclosure... It turned into a territory. That's a sizable territory there. And I have a nice position on the upper side. It's about even. So this was about an even result. Where, uh, just to go back to that variation. 
At this point, if I had played here and got into that other variation I was showing, I think it would have been slightly better for black. And the game, it became an even result. So it's not a complete disaster for me, but it was um, even. Actually, Kadawa was suggesting that I played a wider extension, so maybe up to this point. I, I guess I must have felt satisfied with the position. And white jumps in here. So this move looked really strange to me. I couldn't see what white was aiming at. I was wondering if he had gotten this move from an AI. It seemed very strange to me. It turned out that when I looked at it with an AI myself, white was supposed to play somewhere around here. So that upper left corner, adding a stone to it, was a big move. And the game I played here. So this was correct, you might say. It was the right direction. And taking away the white corner territory, sliding here um, is just a move I've seen a lot in this Joseki-like situation where black is taking away white's corner, making a base in the corner. So it seemed to be a good idea. And I'm building up an attack against white on the side, and white was ready with this shoulder hit. So white can move out into the center. It seems a fairly natural sequence here. And white has a potential eye on the left side, but does not have a living two-eye shape. With this move, black's alive in the corner. And white had to extend on the side. And now I return to the left side to reinforce this group. The fight has cooled down a little bit. I'm not going to be able to kill that white group on the left side very easily. So it's a more a question of territory. So I have this territory, this territory, and this territory are my big territories. Where white's big territories are this one and some territory in the upper left corner. It's pretty balanced. So I, I was thinking it's a close game at this point. And here white played here and here, trying to be playing forcing moves from above and below. This was probably just a touch too greedy. And so with a computer program, the suggested move was just starting the end game. And white's just not going to do anything in the center of the board. The center is not so big as far as territory is concerned. When white did this, this slightly heated up the center. It became a hot spot. And when I played here, actually because of that exchange that white played in this area, um, it's creating a kind of a flow of the stones that is going to give me opportunities to get a large area in the center of the board here. So this is starting to look good for black. White covered here, and I covered once. This white group is not, it's not 100% yet, but I can't really try to kill it yet. So I surround it first, and white played here. It's a very strange move that did not have, uh, did not have a direct effect on white's eyes. So I think white should probably just have played here, which would give white a living shape. A very strange move. He seems to be trying to put some pressure on my group. But for instance, after this, if white tries stuff like this, it's just not going to work because white also has this weakness here. So it's not as if white can put black into any trouble here locally. And I played the one hane, and I jumped. So at this point, I played away. So if I continue this way, and white connects, then this is going to be a seki. So in the game, I left it at this point, and I started to surround the center. And I tried uh, this move. Against this move, locally, if white had played here, this group would have been alive. So if black plays the vital point, the shape point here, white can play on the outside here, and this is a living shape inside. It's, if black fills the inside points, it's going to end up being seven black stones, so that's too many. Or if I play from the outside, white can play here. Slightly painful, but it's alive with a seki. If black cuts here, white will take four black stones to have a living shape. So black cannot cut there, 
And basically it's something like this with a seki shape. So that's zero points for white. That's painful enough. It was the general idea I had in the game. Instead of connecting here, which would have led to the seki shape, white captured the one stone. And this is not alive. So I played here and white connected. Even if white had played here, in this case, I can throw in here and it's not alive. So this was no longer alive. White connected, and I stopped at this point. So if I had played here, then locally the white group would have been dead. But I was not sure how I could answer this move. This is a position which is potentially dangerous for black also, with white having a forcing move here and the threat of a cut here. It just looked like it was very bad Aji. And I did not have time to read it out. So I, I left this variation. It looked just too dangerous for me. And I jumped here, knowing that I have a slight advantage at this point. And white had to add another stone. It just doesn't make sense that white is ending up putting so many stones in white's territory. And still, if black continues like this, white's going to have to connect here to make a seki shape. So it's no territory there. So at this point, the game is looking good for black. It's this kind of game that is just too easy, that can sometimes get a bit messy when you're overconfident. So white jumped here. So far I'm doing very well, I'm cutting white off. And this move is a bit strange, so it's not good. So I should just push through here. And if white tries to connect this way, I can push through here. This is just the territory that white is losing is too much. So it's going to be very, very painful. I don't have any weak groups. It's, there's no way white's going to win this. Or if white cuts this way, then white's just cut off in the center. So this would have been the stronger way to play. It would have been the easy, easier way to win the game. When I played here and white played here, now white's for the time being connected. And I continued attacking with this. A double threat. Threatening to play here and cut white off in the center or to play here and cut white off on the upper side. So it's still working. I just found a more complicated way to go about it. And white plays the capture here, and I get to reduce white's upper side. And white just connected on the second line. So this is a bit painful for white, but at this point I have to continue with the, instead of here, this is where I played. I have to continue with the cut and this would actually improve my local shape a lot. And white might play here to break through, and then I could play here. This is actually, locally, it's a forcing move against the white group on the left side. But I had to play it with good timing. The timing I played it in the game was a bit questionable. In this variation, white's not alive on the left and is not alive in the center. So this is going to be good for black. In the game, I played this first, giving white the opportunity to connect here. So that was not good because uh, you can see that this black territory here is starting to disappear. White is gaining in the local fight in the upper left. So black throws in here. Uh, locally, this is a problem for white. If white captures the stone, black can play here. And this is just dead. That's a dead shape. So white has to expand the shape and black can capture here. So this is a co for the whole white group there. And white played this co threat. So if I lose this co, my group on this side, there's some potential for white to cut here. And so it's a bit thin. And so I decided this was a good time to finish the call. And we ended up with this trade. With two big groups dead. A lot of white stones there. But actually this is fairly close. A fairly close game. It's uh, surprisingly close. So I played these forcing moves from above. And I took the center territory with this. White followed up with this large end game move in the lower right.
And the slide is the last big in-game move. And I crawled here. So this is a fairly reasonable sequence up to this point. White cuts here. This is going to lose some points in the corner, but in return, white gets to play this forcing move. So it's an even trade. And I think white lost a few points with this move here. This could have been the losing move in a case where it would have been better for white to either play here or to, to play this move, which is also a very large move. In the game, white uh, played this honey and I, I got to capture the one stone. And this exchange on the whole was probably not so good for white. This is forcing because if white leaves it, black can play the connection here. And this is going to reduce white's territory by a great deal. So if white plays here, black can play the honey here. White has to answer that. And the whole, all of these white stones here, actually white probably has to answer it here. So white's territory is being reduced by a great deal. And eventually white might be adding some another stone at this point um, to stop black from pushing through there. So it's a, a bit painful for white to be adding all these stones. So white pushed through once and played here. And now I crawled here. At this point, black does have a winning position. We just finished the Ose up to this point. And it's pretty straightforward now. And with this move, white resigned. So at this point, black's 11 points ahead on the board. Four and a half points, I think. So there's two large moves left. There would be this move, or, or there would be this move. And they're about the same, same result. I think actually this one might be slightly better for white. And we get a territory like this. And this is the variation I think that uh, leads to four and a half point win for black. It's what is interesting is what if white plays here and tries to uh, surround all that territory, black can play here and peep here. And white cannot push through and cut because if white does so, then white cannot fight this code. This code would be too dangerous for white um, just because those white stones are in Atari now. And so that would be too much. And white is actually losing territory in this variation. So that doesn't work. So white resigned at this point. It was an exciting game. I think for the first half of the game, up to about this, this point in the game, it was uh, roughly even. And then after I got to play this attack in the center of the board, I did have a slight advantage. And this developed into a larger advantage but as you saw, it got a bit messy towards the end of the game. Um, it was an exciting game. I think on the whole, it was fairly well played. So uh, that's it for this video. And I will be making more videos of some of my recent games. Like the video if you liked it. And sign up to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you.